Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Alyssa Mills to the show. She is a graduate student at the University of Alabama, and we're going to talk about her work studying the largest moon in the solar system, Ganymede. We're also going to talk with Dr. Pedro Bernardinelli, the astronomer who recently found the largest comet ever seen. And it's coming our way. We also look in on the Hubble Space Telescope, which is still out of operation following a computer failure. And we learn details about Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein before talking with the astronomer who first found this massive iceberg in space. Finally, we learn about a new study showing which nearby exoplanets are the most likely places from which to find life on Earth before we explore Jupiter's massive moon Ganymede with astronomer Alyssa Mills. The Hubble Space Telescope, which suffered a failure of a payload computer on June 13th, remains out of operation. Several attempts have been made to recover use of the famed Space Telescope without success. Science instruments aboard Hubble all remain in good condition and are currently in safe mode. Uh, attempts to switch to a backup payload computer suffered the same problem as the primary unit, and the Hubble team is unable to read or write data to the onboard memory. Due to the fact that both payload computers are experiencing the same problem, engineers believe the issue may lie with a power regulator or possibly a data formatter. Both units have backup systems on board the orbiting observatory. A massive comet, recently dubbed Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein, was recently found racing toward the center of the solar system. Likely more than 100 kilometers or a little over 60 miles in diameter, this behemoth of a comet may be the largest ever discovered. Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein will make its closest approach to the Sun in the year 2031, when it will pass just beyond the orbit of Saturn. Unfortunately for sky gazers here on Earth, this distance will prevent it from ever forming a tail large and bright enough to be seen from Earth with the naked eye. Although it should still be visible in moderately sized telescopes. We talk with Dr. Bernardinelli from the University of Pennsylvania who made this historic discovery. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined once again by Dr. Pedro Bernardinelli. He is an astrophysicist at the University of Pennsylvania and most importantly, he just recently discovered a comet. And it was UN 271, a monster comet that will be visiting our solar system in 10 years. Welcome back to the show, Pedro. Thank you, James. It's Thanks. a pleasure to be here again. Great. So just give us a brief rundown. What do we know so far about this comet just 
recently named uh, Comet Doc, uh, Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein. Yeah, so we discovered this comet while <clears throat> searching the images of the Dark Energy Survey for trans-Neptunian objects. This was the work that I carried the past five years at the University of Pennsylvania. It was my entire PhD doing this. I spent my entire PhD doing this work. And while we were analyzing the entirety of the DES data, so we have six years of data, we found this very interesting object, sort of by accident in our search. Uh, we were trying to find these trans Neptunian objects, and we found this thing that, at first glance, we didn't know what it was. Uh, after some initial analysis, we realized that it was it had an orbit that looked, looked very like very much like a comet. And <clears throat> what, what this means is that it was consistent with something coming from the Oort cloud. So the Oort cloud is one of the places where the comets we see in the solar system come from. It's essentially a spherical, spherical cloud of particles and small rocks that occasionally get kicked into the inner solar system and develop tails and come and become beautiful in the sky. <clears throat> so we found this object and we found it at a distance of 29 AU from the sun in our first images. So that is roughly uh, Neptune's dist distance. Neptune is at 30 AU. So it was found at a pretty far distance. And uh, as far as we know, it's one of the farthest, if not the furthest comets ever found. Um, while we took the Diaz images and moved from 29 to 23 AU, which shows that it's moving a lot more than the sorts of things we expect to find. So that was the first thing that drew our attention to this object and we realized that we were seeing something uh, very interesting. Uh, the other thing that is remarkable about this object is that it's pretty big for the standards of comets. It has a diameter of between 100 to 200 kilometers. It depends on what you assume that its surface composition is. And this is big. Most comets have 10 kilometers, tens of kilometers, not 100. So <clears throat> I've seen claims online, and I think they're correct that this is the largest comet found in the telescope era. So in other words, we found something really, really big. <laughs> mm. uh, in our images, we tried to see whether this object had activity. In other words, we tried to see if it was just consistent with a rock or an icy rock or something like that, or if it actually had this cloud of dust and particles around it that comes into form. And we realized that it didn't. So while Diaz measured it, it was essentially just a rock. After we announced it on the Minor Planet Center last week, uh, a few groups of astronomers, including amateur astronomers, astronomers took images of it and quickly realized that it was already active. So now we actually get to say that it's a comet. So we, we can only call this a comet if it has activity. So as of today, the object is uh, currently active, which is amazing. So in other words, this is a really, really big comet. <laughs> and it, we're certain now that it is a comet. That's incredible. And of course, you know, as you mentioned, the, you know, tails are the distinctive feature. Of, mm -hmm. of comets, as you can see in, you know, Yakitaki, picture behind <laughs> me, uh, which was a fabulous comet. But will people actually be able to see any tail from this, either I, with telescopes? I uh, think one of the claims of activity already was showing of a weak tail. So as the object gets closer to the sun, we probably will see it develop some more. But it's never going to come closer than planet Saturn. Yeah, it's going to be, it's perihelion is at 10.9 AU, which is a bit further than uh, Saturn. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, because it is that far, we probably won't get to see it with just our eyes. But I expect that uh, most people with uh, telescopes will be able to see it. Uh, it will be big, bright enough that uh, even a small-ish telescope should be, should be able to measure, to see this object as it reaches perihelion. It's still pretty amazing, you know. And uh, so how, I mean, this thing is huge, just doing, you know, a quick, you know, back of the, back of, back of the envelope calculation before, you know, starting the interview. This thing is on the order of, you know, 10,000 times more massive than Mount Everest. How, how common, um, and tell me if I'm way off there, but, you know, how common are objects this size visiting a, the solar system? The that is a great system? question. 
It's a great question. So we know that, for example, in the Kuiper Belt and in the Transneptunian region, that they have hundreds, if not thousands, of objects of this size. Uh, we have two easy examples. We have Pluto and Aries, which have more than 2,000 kilometers in diameter, and they are the biggest dwarf planets that we know of in the Transneptunian region. And we have a lot more small objects than big objects. So in the Kuiper Belt, there are many of objects with this uh, 100 to 200 kilometer uh, range in size. Uh, for asteroids, they're a bit rarer. There are not that many big asteroids. There are more, there are more bigger TNOs than asteroids. For comets, <clears throat> uh, we expected there to be very big comets. Uh, simply because we have an idea of what the distribution of sizes of these things look like. So from many observations, we have we sort of have an idea of how many things we should find at each uh, given size. Um, so there should be some big objects, but not as many as the smaller ones, which we see more frequently. So in other words, something this big for a comet is pretty rare. And in fact, it was the first measured at that size. <laughs> wow. And it's still, you know, uh, as you say, something like over 20 AUs away from us still. And right, right now it's a 20 AU. Yeah, 20 AU. Okay. So, um, so how do we, in the first, you know, baby pictures that you shared on Twitter, and thanks for doing that, um, is, you know, you're still seeing it as just a few pixels. So how do we, how do we study this object as it approaches? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, as you said, uh, to us, this is just a bunch of pixels, right? Uh, uh, these things, you know, in the way that I first looked at it, it was essentially just a few rows in a spreadsheet that happened to have a special mark saying, hey, we should take, I should take a look at this. Um, then, uh, once we look at the images, then we have a measurement of the amount of light that this object was reflecting, which is related to both its surface and its uh, size. And so, even though it's just a few pixels, uh, we still have a good idea of how bright it was. And especially with the data we have from the Dark Energy Survey, we have extremely well calibrated data. So we have fantastic measurements of uh, the brightness of this thing. Uh, we also have multiple filters, Im images in multiple filters. So we have uh, images in four different filters, which tell us essentially, in this range of light, this object is this bright. In this range of light, this object is this bright. So we essentially get to see what is happening as we move across the visible spectrum with the surface of this object. And this is a very, very, Low resolution, so to speak, way of trying to figure out what is the surface composition. What is the surface composition of this thing? Um, as time moves forward, people will be able to take spectra of it, which will tell us uh, essentially which elements are present in the surface, and thus we we will manage to figure out what is actually in there. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. We we just see how much light it reflects, and then we. Everything else we do comes off that. And I think when the news first came out a couple of days ago, the um, at least a couple of days ago from the time of taping here, um, a lot of people were surprised that you know we the earliest images of this were recorded in 2014. Can you just give us a you know a little look at how, what attracted you to this particular object? It seems like there's a whole lot of data being produced since then. Yeah, with, especially with Diaz, we have an insane amount of data. Uh, so this search uh, took 15 to 20 million CPU hours. To put this in perspective, it's essentially having one computer solve a single problem for 2,000 years. So this is how much wild time it would take if we were using just one computer. Of course, we were using 100, so this took just about six months. but after six months of essentially crunching numbers and I was waking up at 3 a.m. every day to make sure that my things were running in the supercomputer I was using, uh, I took a look at the final results and I realized that while most things looked what we like what I expected to find, 
So they look like TNOs, essentially. Uh, nothing that surprising there. This one in particular had, because of its orbit, it was so completely different from uh, everything else that we had seen in our data that it, it quickly caught my attention. Um, we have some diagnosis pages that I make, essentially with a bunch of images of the object and some information on the potential discovery. So after I saw the orbit for this thing, I quickly made the, the page for this object and I sent it to uh, Bernstein, who was my PhD advisor slash uh, collaborator. And I told him, hey, take a look at this, see if you think it's real. And I didn't send you the information on the orbit, I just sent information on the images. And his answer to me five minutes later was, yeah, this is probably real. This is, looks more real than most of the things we're looking at. Wow. Then I sent him the orbit and he said, oh, okay, what, what is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a very nice conversation uh, on Zoom where I was showing my screen and we were trying to figure out what this what this thing was. Wow. Wow. That must have been so incredible. Yeah, it was how, a... a how did that make you feel? I was surprised, actually, to see something like this because we were not looking for comments. We were looking for transmitted objects. So, uh, <clears throat> And honestly, this first few days, I was thinking that I should probably do some very serious background study on comments because I realized that I don't know as much as I should after discovering a thing like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm um, just curious, you know, we recently had Bruce Betts on the show from the Planetary Society talking about planetary defense and, you know, um, so I'm, you know, just thinking about, you know, the size of this thing, you know, many, 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 many times larger than the than the uh, asteroid that killed the comet, uh, killed off the dinosaurs. Um, are we able to learn, what are we able to learn about planetary defense by looking at objects that are coming from the Oort cloud? That's a good question. So one thing we can try to figure out is <clears throat> essentially how many objects tend to come per year from the Oort cloud to the inner solar system. And we can see if they have some preference in direction. We, they have some preference to how close they get to the Earth and et cetera. So by monitoring these things, we basically can try to predict, uh, if uh, we can try to predict, predict how big the next object will be and how, uh, and try to figure out something about this, uh, the, this object's orbit. Of course, the problem with the Oort cloud is that we think it's spherical, spherical. So an object can come from anywhere. But then we can at least have an idea of what size to expect by measuring many objects like this. And, you know, of course, it's much too early for anything to have started uh, as, far as, as far as missions to it are concerned. But if, you know, the powers that be were to come to you and say, hey, Pedro, we're putting together a spacecraft to look, to go directly to this thing and check it out. What would you want to have on board? That's a good question. You know, as a scientist, I think the the best we can ask is just for the best instruments and the best people uh, to do something like this. And so if someone says, okay, it's mission to this uh, object, then, you know, I, I would just want, want to make sure that people do the best that they can with the technology available. Uh, so we have, it's essentially a unique opportunity to see a big object like this uh, from the work cloud, super close. So, you know, as long as they don't cheap out some instruments and et cetera, I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so very scientific answer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what would you want to know most about it if you could have one answer, one question answered, what would it be? That's a, that's a good question. Let me think about that. I guess one interesting question would be, what is the relationship of the surface from this or cloud comments to what we see on the Kuiper belt? Since I've spent my last five years trying to understand how the Kuiper belt works, uh, it makes sense to ask, okay, so we know that these things are farther. So how similar and how different are they to what we see closer uh, to the sun? Yeah, that's great. And so what's next? 
finally, what what is next in your in your study of this body? Um, yeah, so we are now finishing the Diaz Year Six release paper. So we're going to present our catalog of objects, which of course includes this thing and 800 other other transactunian objects. So this will be done in <clears throat> the next couple of weeks or months, and officially put it out. Uh, as a paper saying, yeah, we found this thing, this is how we found it, and explain to the community how we did that. Um, I am particularly interested in the dynamics of this object, so trying to figure out what it did in the past four million years. Um, so the way we do this is we essentially run a simulation that has an entire solar system or just giant planets, because they're the things that matter in, uh, in this problem, and this object and the fact of the Milky Way as well, because since this is in the Oort cloud, we need to worry about the Milky Way and have an idea of what happened in this, uh, to this object uh, as, in the last four million years. And so in other words, we can get an idea if it's the first time that it passed the inner solar system or if it had uh, another passage in the past. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Pedro. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm glad you asked me again. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, congratulations on this remarkable discovery of comic Bernardelli, Bernardinelli Bernstein. Thank you. And that was Dr. Pedro Bernardinelli, uh, astrophysicist at the University of Pennsylvania. A new study from the American Museum of Natural History and the Carl Sagan Institute examined thousands of stars within 326 light years of Earth. They found that more than 1,700 of these stars are placed so that astronomers there are most likely to be able to discover signs of life on Earth. Now, Roughly 70% of planets orbiting other stars were found using the transit method uh, when planets pass in front of their parent stars as seen from Earth, blocking out a small amount of light from the star. From worlds within the 1700 systems, alien astronomers would be able to easily find our world and study our atmosphere using this method to study concludes. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to visit with Alyssa Mills. She is a graduate student at the University of Alabama and we're going to talk about her work studying the largest moon in the solar system, Ganymede. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Alyssa Mills. She is a graduate student at the University of Alabama and has been interning at JPL. She's done some fascinating work studying Ganymede and the Jovian system. Welcome to the show, Alyssa. Thank you for having me. Michael, so just for, you know, Ganymede, of course, is the largest uh, moon of the solar system. Uh, and what is it about this giant moon that makes it so interesting? Well, there's a few things that makes Ganymede so interesting. I mean, one, it is the largest moon of our solar system. It's actually a little bit larger than Mercury, right. at about a, like a radius of 2,630 kilometers, if you want the numbers. But just know it's bigger than Mercury. But like Mercury, it also creates its own magnetic field. Right. 
right. which is super interesting because it's the only man in our solar system to create a magnetic field. And we're kind of curious of why don't other men create magnetic fields? What makes a body make a magnetic field? And then also, to add on to the list of interesting things about Ganymede, is that it has an ocean. But it may actually have multiple layers of ocean, like an ice cream sandwich of ocean, <laughs> which could harbor life. So it makes Ganymede one of probably the most interesting bodies out there. I know some people may disagree, but you could think of it as like, it's like our moon, but with like extra spice to it. It's got an ocean, it's got ice, it's got a magnetic field, it's got everything. It's just a, such a fascinating, fascinating body. And of course, you know, we've seen some new photos coming from uh, the Juno spacecraft, which just passed by there, made the first close encounter with Ganymede in a generation. What are some of the new things we're learning about this giant moon? So some of the new things that we're seeing on these images is that we can see the groove terrain a lot more. We can see the contrast of the dark and light terrain. And like the dark terrain is actually some of the oldest material on Ganymede and the light terrain is some of the youngest. And the images from like the Galilei spacecraft and the Pioneer spacecraft and the Voyagers weren't just good enough resolution for us to see the great detail. We're seeing more of the tectonics that are happening on Ganymede. And the next thing we're actually probably gonna do is compare the images from those past spacecraft to Juno to see has anything changed. If something has changed, that means something's going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's like ice volcanoes maybe resurfacing or something's causing it to resurface or change. And so that's what we're really interested in is looking at the new differences. It's fascinating. And how do you, when you look at the terrain, you know, you're talking about the old, the darker stuff being older and lighter stuff being newer. First, can you tell us um, a little bit about how you determine ages like that? And um, what causes that? Why is the older stuff darker? So the darker terrain, the reason why we know it's older is that it has the most impacts. Um, whenever you have a newer surface or what we term as a newer surface is something that lacks craters. There's something that's happened to it to cause a resurfacing. The resurfacing can be like, maybe you have like a volcano that's erupted and it's gonna literally wipe out what was there before. So you can think about like on earth, you had a volcano and you had some type of terrain, well, you don't know what's under that anymore. So that's a new surface. Right. And so because you don't have those craters, which are some of the oldest um, parts of the solar system with impacts, that's how we know the dark terrain is gonna be older than the other uh, light terrain. Hmm. And so is the light terrain lighter in color because it came up from this, uh, the vanilla ice cream from the ice cream sandwich? Of Ganymede, so, is this what water ice that's causing that, or is this something else? So it's mostly going to be water ice. I mean, you still have some little bit of sprinkles of other things because you also have like radiation that's happening. So like the particles from Jupiter are going to hit into Ganymede and cause also some of the discoloration. And so because the light terrain is younger, it hasn't had much of that bombardment, so it hasn't had that color change happen yet. So that's also how we know, like, oh, dark terrain has been more like radiation that's happened to call it cause that discoloration. Hmm. And when, uh, you, know, you know, like when Gino passed, it uh, made observations of Ganymede in visible light, infrared light, radio waves, and microwaves. Um, how do astronomers use these, you know, observations in different wavelengths? How do, you, how do you bring them together into a cohesive idea of what it is that you're looking at? Okay, um, so it's probably the best way to explain the different instruments is probably more on Jupiter. It's a little bit easier to think about. So if you know that we have like an electromagnetic spectrum, so you have very short little wavelengths, um, that's gonna be more of like your gamma rays, your X-rays, the ones that move really fast and are short. And then you have at the other end, your radio. And visible is kind of in that middle ground. So if you have visible and you have UV, which is just slightly um, gonna be the shorter wavelength and infrared, you're gonna get a very coherent picture. And so what that means is that you can look at different depths into a body. So with Jupiter, 
because you have clouds and they're so deep, we can actually look deeper and deeper. So your UV is not going to be able to look as deep into it. So that's like your Juno cam that has like the red, green, blue filters. Mm -hmm. But then if you combine with the UV and infrared instruments, you're going to be able to see the thousands of kilometers down into the clouds. And so they actually were looking at the red spot and they were actually able to look at it thousands of kilometers. So now we're not just seeing the very top, so like in the background image. That would be like, oh, this is a UV. But as you add more and more instruments, you're going to be able to see deeper and deeper, which will tell you more about the structure of the body too. Hmm. And you mentioned that Ganymede is the only satellite of our solar system known to have a magnetic field. Uh, first of all, why? <laughs> what do we know? What's causing it? <laughs> so the question of why, we still don't know. Because we have only had the one spacecraft, Galileo, to really measure the magnetic field. But now we've had one flyby of Juno to add to that database. And sadly, we only had six flybys around Ganymede. And to really characterize the magnetic field, you really need to have global coverage or have a lot of flybys. And that's why the JUICE mission by the European Space Agency is very important. So we can't really explain why does it have a magnetic field until we fully understand the magnetic field itself. So we really need to just go back, learn more, do lots of flybys. So I can't really answer the question why, because no one actually knows why. Um, mm. But it is probably most likely generated like um, how we have an Earth through the dynamo. That's that liquid core moving around and rotating and causing a magnetic field. We think the same thing may happen on Academy, or mm. there could be maybe a different process, but that's why we're going back. That's where we're going to have Juice go out there and really take this measurement so we fully understand what's going on and then maybe that can help us understand why don't other moons have magnetic fields that they're generating. Huh. So that's fascinating. I never would have thought of a liquid core or semi-molten core being in a body this small. Yeah. After all that time. Uh, so just journey with us. Can you bring us just through um, a dive through Ganymede? You know, what, what does it look like if you're able to to travel through, travel through this moon to its core. So if you could travel through Ganymede, the first thing you're gonna hit on top is gonna to be that icy crust. So most of the satellites in the outer solar system are gonna have an icy crust. Um, it may have some mixture of rock just because of all those impacts. So you're gonna have some ejecta. And so it's gonna be about 60% uh, rock overall and 40% ice for the entire um, body of Ganymede. So once you get past the icy crust, you're going to hit an ocean. So we don't know if it's just an ocean by itself or there are different layers of ice also between the ocean. So I call it like an ice cream sandwich because you know you have like two pieces of like that chocolate cookie and then you have that ice cream. So think of it, this ice cream sandwich is ice where that cookie is, and then you have ocean, but maybe there's multiple ice cream sandwiches in there. So maybe you have multiple layers of ocean. And so this ocean going to be a depth of about like 190 kilometers, which is really thick. Um, has more water than what Earth would have altogether, even though Ganymede is smaller than Earth. And then once you get past all that ice and that ocean, you could hit the mantle, so just like we have a mantle, it's also going to have a mantle. And then underneath that, you will have your core. And that core probably has an outer core and an inner core, just like Earth, because it is generating a magnetic field. Wow. So how does that magnetic field affect uh, the environment around it? So it's a little complicated because it's a magnetic field within a magnetic field. Right. There's right. magnets. Yeah, Jupiter's magnetic field is so vast, it actually goes past like Callisto, it actually goes quite a few Jupiter radii out. And so because you have Jupiter in this system, it's going to deflect like particles like the solar wind. So these are very high energetic particles coming from the sun that are not going to hit Ganymede because Jupiter has its own magnetic field to shield those away. So Ganymede has a little bit of a different structure in its magnetic field where it's going to not have those solar wind particles hitting it, but it's going to have 
radiation and particles from Jupiter coming to try to hit Ganymede. And so you can kind of think of it, it's like Earth, but it has a little bit extra protection, but then Jupiter kind of wants to sabotage it. And then you got Io kind of throwing particles at Jupiter. And so that causes a whole mess too. That's how you get like this thing called a plasma tour. So cool. And of course, you know, Ganymede is being, is one of the, I don't know how to phrase this, the, uh, one of the things I find most interesting in our solar system are the water worlds, of course, yeah, like agree. Ganymede, Europa. And the question is, how do we, how do we explore it? Is there any, how do we explore the oceans of Ganymede? So one way to explore the oceans without actually going in them is actually looking at the magnetic field. Um, so if you have a magnetic field being generated, it's going to be generated through um, like a salty ocean. That's where you can have what you call a induced field. So that's when you have a magnetic field that's already being out there. So like Jupiter's magnetic field, and then you have the um, electric field being generated. And so it causes all these different types of fields. Um, and if you can measure the field from the ocean, that will tell you about how deep it is just from using the magnetic field, so mapping that magnetic field. And also you can look at the ocean through gravity. You can also look at through um, your radio instruments. And if you really want to, you could have a lander. Um, there isn't any proposed right now for Ganymede for lander-wise from NASA at least. Um, but for like Europa, there was a Europa lander that was proposed. And once you have a lander, then you can understand the dynamics that are happening inside the ocean. And after that, maybe you could have like a probe that goes into it. And so those are also being tested right now. They're being tested in like Antarctica. So one of the leaders of that, like, um, is Brittany Schmidt. She has an instrument. So if you're really interested, you can look at her probe. I think it's called like deep dive. Mm. I don't remember what each one is called. There's so many. Yeah. All right. So many great ideas out there right now. The the future of space exploration is just just amazing, you know. Um, and so, what is next in the in the exploration of Ganymede? So, what's next is I'm only going to talk about the ones that are fully funded. And they're also in their test phases. Yep. Um, so, the next true mission that's going to be dedicated for Ganymede is the European Space Agency's JUICE mission. Um, what it stands for is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, I think. I think so. I don't know. Acronyms are really hard. That's all astronomy and planetary sciences is acronyms, and you get lost in them. Um, so that, Some better than others. <laughs> <you know. laughs> that one, it's OK. Um, but that one, that satellite is actually going to look at all the Galilean moons, at least for Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, but it's primarily going to focus on Ganymede because it's so interesting. Like, why is it creating a magnetic field? We really want to know that because if we understand why moon could create a magnetic field, then maybe we could learn more about exoplanets or they exoplanets have a moon. Do we expect them to have like a magnetic field? So you really kind of need to understand the origins of everything to understand oh, do we expect this in other places if we meet conditions? Um, so JUICE will launch in 2022. So the next mission after that in the timeline is going to be Europa Clipper. Uh, Europa Clipper is primarily focused on Europa, but it will take some images of um, Ganymede. I don't know exactly what they want to do, how, if they're going to turn in all the instruments, but that can always be a question for them, but Europa Clipper will launch in 2024. And there's like some talk that the Chinese and maybe India are gonna have missions to Ganymede, mm. but confirmed is uh, ESA's JUICE mission and Europa Clipper. But JUICE is primarily gonna focus on Ganymede. Great, I'm really excited for JUICE. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Alyssa. It was a pleasure talking with you. But thank you for having me, it was a pleasure. Thanks, you're welcome back anytime. So, and that was Alyssa Mills, graduate student at the University of Alabama.
Next week, we're going to be joined by New York Times best-selling author Earl Swift, the author of Across the Airless Wilds, the first major history book examining NASA's lunar budget. Make sure to visit with us then. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit the cosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Compa Companion, please subscribe, download, and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit the cosmiccompanion.com or the cosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.